Good evening, everyone. I'd like to open up the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting today, February 13th, day before Valentine's Day. It, um, we uh, did not open up an executive session previously, so we are opening for the first time now. Um, I'd like to start with um, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. And we have a, uh, a guest leader for the Pledge of Allegiance, Brendan Tedstone. So, Mr. Tedstone, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Tedstone. That's, that's great. That is one well-spoken yes. Tedstone, isn't it? <laughs> is he so much like his mother? Thank goodness he has no stories about growing up here in Hopkinton, huh? I know. Thank sir, you, Brendan. The chief that appreciates awesome. that. Yes, sir. Okay. This brings us to a public forum where the residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Is there anybody in our studio audience that would like to come up and address the Board of Selectmen? Come on up and sign in, please. <laughs> We're on 25 Chamberlain Street. And uh, I'm just coming in front of you just to ask for you to review the planning board meeting from last night. And uh, it's just something that I think the town officials should be aware of how an important board in town is operating business. So I was there on behalf of the Chamberlain Wayland Street organization, but I'm also a member of the Chamber of Commerce. And if business owners were considering moving into the town of Hopkinton and sat through a meeting like last night, uh, I think they would have second thoughts about positioning here. So I would just ask you to, to take a look at that, okay? I also, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, want to talk about the uh, pouring license that's coming up later on. Should I speak to that at that later, or should I do that during the public comment? Um, yeah, well, why don't we wait for, the, um, for that then? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to clip and address the Board of Selectmen in the town? Okay. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a testament to people in town for, for someone like Mr. Foisey to take time out of, his, out of his life the second day in a row to see, so he was at the planning board meeting last night and he was so unhappy with it that he felt so inclined to come before us and, and kind of bring it to our attention. So I think that's a great thing and thank you very much, Ron. And it's nice to see when people like yourself and anybody else that take pride in the town, when something like that offends you or, or you don't like how things are going or if you do like how things are going, it's nice to have someone like that come up and put their two cents in. In case some of us didn't know about it, now we can take a look at it. And thank you for your, uh, for your passion for Hopkins. I'd like Mr. Chairman, Absolutely. if I made a comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Foisey. And to everybody watching at home, election season is coming up, um, nomination papers are available, and um, you know, on every board, elections have consequences, and when citizens are dissatisfied with the way town government is working, um, I really appreciate people stepping up and expressing their concerns, but to everybody, we all have a responsibility to shape this town the way we the way we feel it should be. And year upon year, whether it's the town committees, you're looking for people to fill these spots. Sometimes the spots go unopposed. I can remember 18 years <coughs> ago when I decided to run for planning board, the reason I decided to run was because nobody was stepping up for that job. And I recognize what an important, critical position the planning board is in town. And I was shocked that no one was interested enough to put in the time, and you really do put in the time on all these boards, but you've got to do it. So 
at this season, I would really ask everyone to take a serious look at the positions that are open. And if you really care about this town, give it yourself. Step up to the plate. Maybe there's someone else that can do it better than you. But the fact that you just st stood up and stepped up, um, we need people to do that. Excellent. Thank you. Like always, we just need uh, reasonable people making rational decisions. <clears throat> or we'll take rational people making reasonable decisions. But that's what it really comes down to, is putting your heart into it. And that's the way our whole government was, was set up 230 years ago, was um, that uh, people can rule themselves and, and people are just supposed to step up for a little while and do the job and then go back to their farms and store keeps. Anyway, thanks very much. Thanks again, Ron. Okay, let's move on to the consent agenda. On there, we've got the uh, parade permit, max performance, the 12th <laughs> annual triathlon. I will consider approving parade permit for, for, uh, from Tim Richmond on behalf of the max performance for the 12th annual triathlon events at the Hopkins State Park with uh, access to roads in Hopkinton on May 19, 2018 and on September 9, 2018. No full road closures are being requested. That, that one's that one's got as much uh, documentation as the uh, 50 pages. <laughs> There's a marathon <laughs> inside there. That's why I figured it was, it was all right to put it on the consent. And then also a um, uh, special temporary alcohol license and entertainment license. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a special temporary alcohol license and entertainment license <coughs> from Peter Messon on behalf of Western Nurseries for a Patriots Day event on April 16, 2018 to be held at Western Nurseries. And the third is a resignation. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting the resignation of John Savignano from the Hopkinton Cultural Council and thanking him for his service. Does anybody want to break any of these out? Yes. Um, I have two small breakout items on item two, the parade permit for max performance, and also the alcohol uh, license at Western Nurseries. So we're breaking them all out. Well, not the, Chair, the board minutes. Approve items one, one and four, four of the five. consent agenda. Okay. Oh, the, oh, right. I forgot about Second. the minutes. Thank you. With the understanding that there, there's a letter that goes out. I don't have to break that out each time that we're going to send a letter out. To Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. yes, exactly. And yeah, he's saying he does also a great job, and Zach has yep. been there for a few years. Great guy. Okay, so um, with that, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Most those two pass. Okay, let's, now we're breaking out um, uh, numbers two and three. Um, Ms. Wright. Um, on the parade permit, very small item. Sounds like this group is uh, well organized and has done this many times in town, so I don't really see any problems. I did notice that the police chief asked that uh, the group get in touch. It wasn't the chief, it was actually uh, Lieutenant Porter, that they contact him a month in advance to uh, work out details on details, signage, and notifications. So uh, I just, because he made that special request, want to make sure that's somehow indicated in the, in the permit in the permit that they are to contact the police a month before for, for uh, final okay. details. Does anybody else have anything to add to that one? Nope. All right, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to uh, grant the uh, parade permit for Max Performance 12th Annual Triathlon. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay, motion carries. Special Temporary Alcohol License, Entertainment License. Ms. Wright. And this is small as well. Um, I was glad to see the update that they've decided to uh, go f switch from the hard liquor just to providing beer and wine. And my understanding is that the service is to start at 8 a.m. But I noticed on the application, um, and I think this is something that our application needs updating on, uh, the event begins at 7, understandably, because <laughs> you can't get in or out of town after about six, uh, but the services to start at seven, uh, at eight, um, which so those are two things that are not clear on the current application. It says hard liquor. It should be just beer and wine, and it um, says the event starts at seven, but it doesn't indicate when the alcohol service is going to start, um, and I think that our permit should probably include that in the future. The time the event starts and ends is different from the time that alcohol service at an event begins 
and is scheduled to end. So um, going forward, I'd like to see an, a beginning and end of alcohol service added to that. Um, and I just want to be sure that on this one that that is made clear that both the time, eight, not seven, and beer and wine, not hard liquor, are noted um, because they are different than what's on the application. Does anybody else have anything else? Is there a local beer supplier going to be presenting it at this thing as well, or supplying at this thing? I'm not sure. I have my answer. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's um, you know uh, several years ago. Uh, I know Mr. Kamalo led the charge for the board of selectmen to find ways for the marathon to more directly benefit uh, different organizations in town. I think this is a great idea. It's a great extension to that. Um, it's not dealing with bid numbers, but uh, you know, again, it's it's benefiting a good organization. Uh, the town, we enjoy having the BAA here, and we enjoy hosting uh, that start of the marathon. Uh, but at the same time, it can be a hardship for different businesses and uh, and the people in town as well. Uh, no matter how much fun it is, you know, for a couple of hours. Uh, so this is a great this is a great thing. I'm glad to see that uh, businesses and organizations are finding a way to monetize this, and when it's benefiting, uh, you know, something like 26.2, uh, you know, it's even better. So great. And I was just glad that you guys got to have a uh, run through back in September. That's why I, I thought that this could go in the consent agenda <coughs> because it already worked well once. And the same thing with the 12th annual before that. Oh, any further discussion? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the special temporary alcohol license and entertainment license for Weston Nurseries uh, submitted by Peter Mezzett for Marathon Day, April 16, 2018. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed and abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks for doing this. Okay, ambulance fund gifts. The Board of Select will consider accepting the ambulance fund gifts in the memory of Fire Chief Richard McMillan. Mr. Ted Stone, yeah. you do the honors. Proud to talk about this. So, obviously we talked about Chief McMillan passing away at our last meeting. <clears throat> he was a great guy, great guy for the town, and uh, a pioneer in the, in the fire service, not just the fire department, but in the fire service. So, uh, it's not surprising to see all these all this uh, sh uh, show of gratuity for all the hard work selflessly that the chief did for years and years and years here. It's, it's nice that uh, you know, we can benefit, unfortunately it's posthumously, but it's nice that we can benefit as a department from people's generosity. So thank you very much and it's a, it's a, a great charity that these, some of these people are choosing at the end of their lives and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us get our department uh, you know, further its training and its professionalism to be safe and secure moving forward. So it's a, it's a great gift. Thank you. If I may, I just want to take a minute um, because the list, the list is just huge and it represents over $1,000 in contributions. And um, <clears throat> I just want to recognize by name the contributors. The Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts, Patricia Aspinwall, Paul Phipps Insurance, James Bartlett, Timothy Clifford and Eleanor Arsenault, Townsend Yacht Club, Linda Rosener and um, M. Teresa Goodale, Russell Ellsworth and Mary Ellsworth, Deborah Bent, Nancy DeWolf, Judith Keefe, Charlotte Colella, John and Ruth Knowles, Francis and Phyllis Pine, James and Patricia Parker, Janet E. Ray, and Henry Bor Boroyan. Um, and as I said, this group of people has already has contributed over a thousand dollars, and those contributions just keep growing in. So I think it's it's worth uh, giving them personal thanks. Oh, thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, I request a motion to accept the gifts to the ambulance fund in, mem in memory of Rick McMillan. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Okay. Moving right along, um, we have a uh, compliance check results discussion or action. The Board of Selectmen will receive results from a compliance check conducted by the Hopkins Police Department 
per the police chief report, Bill's Pizza failed a compliance check by serving alcohol to an individual under 21 in violation of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 34. Chief. And Mr. Chair, yes. as, as the chief is setting up for his presentation, I think it needs to be to be said that the compliance checks are part of a wider uh, community education program uh, that the board has put in place with regard to the sale and distribution of alcohol in town, uh, and that education process begins at the time when the selectmen issue the license. Uh, I remember many a times uh, at meetings where the selectmen have emphasized uh, to the licensees uh, the importance of complying with the town's alcohol policies as well as the ABCC's regulations regarding the distribution of uh, alcohol. And as part of the town's comprehensive community education program relative to this topic, I believe the police department has set up what I believe uh, to be an effective, practical, and user-friendly program uh, for conducting the compliance checks, again, as part of the community policing strategy that the chief and the department um, have, have, have put forth uh, for, 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 for many years. It also needs to be said that the, the success of the compliance checks relies on the partnership that has been built between the town and the establishments that sell and distribute alcohol. Uh, and so I think it's, it's significant um, for the board and for the community uh, to, to hear directly from the chief how this program is, is rolling out. I've been with the town now for, for nine years, and, and I can say that uh, the success, the success of, the, of the checks really speak to the community's commit, uh, commitment to community policing, building a forward-looking uh, relationship between the <coughs> establishments, and most importantly, marketing Hopkinton as a community that supports a safe, healthy, and productive environment for our youth. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. Chief. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamalo. Yeah, our goal is is just to gain compliance. We want to educate, work with the establishments out there, and uh, I think we have a, a real good partnership. Unfortunately, you know, we have to ensure that people are doing their due diligence when it comes to serving alcohol. And uh, as far as uh, this last thing, uh, there was only one who served alcohol, and that was uh, Bill's Pizza. But uh, hats off to all the other establishments that uh, did their due diligence to uh, COD, the undercover who went into the establishment. But uh, the, the thing was uh, run on December 4th, uh, two, 2017, um, Detective uh, DeBoer, along with De Detective Bill Burchard, used a part-time uh, uh, dispatcher for our police department who is, uh, was at the age of uh, 20 years. They did all their proper protocols before they actually sent her out, including doing a, uh, a breathalyzer on her and uh, supplying her with a listening device for her own protection. Um, she went into the, uh, at 18, 11 hours, which is 6, 11 p.m., uh, the dispatcher went into Bill's Pizza, located at 14 Main Street. She sat down at the bar and asked for, uh, for a drink menu. She then ordered a margarita from the bartender who made and served her the drink. She stated that the bartender, uh, she told the bartender she was getting a phone call, which was proper protocol for her when she was served, and she stepped outside to report it to the detectives. Uh, detectives went to the restaurant, uh, identified the bartender as a Teresa Boyce. Uh, detectives also spoke with the uh, owner, uh, Mr. Escaleras, uh, explaining that they were performing alcohol checks and that uh, Teresa did in fact serve an underage party without checking for any identification. 
Uh, from that point, uh, they left the establishment and they were advised a report would be prepared and submitted to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Um, has, um, has Bill Pizza, Bill's Pizza contacted you in any way? Because I know that you have a, um, a uh, training that you sometimes do and stuff. I was wondering. Yes, uh, immediately after the, uh, uh, the sting, I was contacted by the owner who was uh, inquiring about the, uh, the training, and uh, I, I put him in touch with uh, Detective Burchard, who's going to be holding a class with them and uh, making sure this right away. Anybody have any questions for Chief? I do. Um, Chief, have there, have there been any other incidents with this establishment? Um, there was an, uh, an issue uh, uh, years back, but it might have been a different license holder, but it, it wasn't with serving alcohol. It was another uh, incident where the, the license was suspended. That was about it was four, before or, five my years time. four or five years ago. Yeah. yeah. And it was a not an alcohol related, directly related uh, violation, but another violation that put the license at risk and it was suspended for a couple of days. Anything else? But this is their first violation on the uh, compliance. Um um, uh, Mr. Kamalo, is it uh, is it uh, proper to uh, have the uh, proprietor up since they saw that he just came in? To answer anything? Uh, I, would, I would think so. Okay. Yeah, but I just want to okay, you know, break with uh, Jack. With Jack. Don't go far, Chief. We're gonna probably need you here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Zach Siarcos. Uh, I'm one of the owners at Bill's Pizza. Um, the incident that the chief was referring to uh, did go on just like that. Um, my bond tender made a mistake that night. Um, she doesn't usually cover. It was a Friday night. Um, Teresa doesn't work Friday nights normally. Um, she was over overwhelmed. Uh, regardless, no excuse. Um, since then, we've done uh, some more training. Uh, we've gone through the tip certification again with all my bartenders. Um, as Chief said, we did contact him, and uh, he will be holding a, or one of the sergeants will be holding a class to uh, hammer in, you know, how serious uh, this is, serving alcohol. Um, don't expect any incidents like that to happen again. Anybody have any questions? For, uh, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I guess I'd just like to comment that, uh, you know, I've been on the board coming up on nine years now. Uh, every year, at least once a year, uh, whoever the police chief is comes and delivers us a report. And this is the first time I remember, and maybe Mr. Herc can uh, refresh my memory if I'm wrong, but it's the first time I can remember there being a violation during this during this uh, training process. Um, you know. I, I think that I think that you know Bills is a, a fantastic business in the community. They do a lot for the community. Uh, I think that uh, after conversations with uh, you know the town manager and the chief and and understanding what the goal is uh, with these uh, with these compliance checks, you know it 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 is geared toward education. You know certainly. We want to see and we want to enforce, uh, but it's also geared toward education. And when you have a group of businesses such as the ones that we have in Hopkinton, um, again, I think that I think that over the nine years, the violations that have happened have been extremely few and far between. Um, <clears throat> I can't recall any business that has been a repeat offender. Um, under the same ownership and uh, and I think that we should be pretty proud of that and I think that uh, that's an indication of the approach that the town is taking um, you know largely led by the police department and uh, in my opinion uh, you know I'm certainly open to others on the board you know I think that we should let this be one of those learning situations one of those uh, you know learning moments I guess 
and um, you know make sure that all the trainings that the chief is talking about uh, are followed and and that everybody goes through that uh, it sounds like uh, you know Zach has already started that process um, it's not to minimize how important it is uh, you know and certainly if if this were to happen again or anything like that uh, you know the board would have to you know rethink its approach uh, but in my opinion I think that we should you know push this through as as a learning experience is right just to out of curiosity, do you usually have a policy where you ID everyone? I yeah, know, of course, yes. Where it doesn't matter what your age is. It's <laughs> actually a compliment sometimes. But, uh, um, yes, absolutely. So, so yes. It, it's not that the server is making a judgment call. Um, that's usually standard procedure. It's standard procedure, yes. So she was just busy and missed that step. Yeah, she's, she's our Monday, Tuesday bartender normally. Um, she was covering... Um, she just got overwhelmed, you know, she, there's no excuse, she just made a mistake. So you're right, there is no excuse, um, but as someone who has, may or may not have been into bills very frequently, um, a Monday or Tuesday afternoon is significantly different than a Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and it, like you said, there's no excuse, you know, she, she dropped the ball and I chose character on your part by coming in and saying, you know, mea culpa, I, we dropped the ball and we're, we're gonna do our best for it to not happen again. Um, <laughs> Friday, you know, Monday or Tuesday, you might have three customers at the bar. Friday, you may have, like, at fire, I'm not saying you'd ever have more people than what the <laughs> fire code allowed, but you would have at capacity <laughs> at the bar, at the, you know, the, the basketball teams coming in, <laughs> soccer team, whatever. And, it does, I'm sure it does get chaotic. I'm not a bartender, I don't even pretend to be one. Um, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be a, tough, uh, a tough thing to do. But, you know, that's, that's an occupational hazard. And um, we had another restaurant come in front of us when I first came on, a very similar concept. Uh, I mean, very similar infraction. And um, we did take a, an education approach and um, you know whether it's you or any other facility, I don't want to say that I'm willing to give everybody one get out of jail free card. Um, but like Mr. Sestari said, you know you are a, a, a prominent business in the community and you do a good job. And um, I think that there's no question on how serious you take it. And um, you know hopefully it can be an educational thing. And some of the other businesses in town can learn the fact that you're up here sweating it out in front of us, mm -hmm. that maybe we need to reinforce these tip certification and these, these, uh, these rules and regulations with our bartenders so we don't have to go up there and sweat it out in front of them. So sure. uh, I tend to lean towards Mr. Sitari's idea where we can turn this into an educational thing. <clears throat> I know that this is a very serious part of your, like oh, having bills Pizza is not a hobby of yours, it's an occupation of yours, and uh, I think that it's, it's uh, I don't think that the seriousness, seriousness is lost of, on this incident with you, so um, that's all I have to say. Mr. Hart. I, I think we have had a couple over the years, you know, that there was one closer to 495, yeah. similar, I think, sting situation, because uh, I saw the chief back there thinking when you were talking about it too. Um, and I think in that case we did do a one day, or maybe it was a two day, for the first infraction. Um, I'm not inclined to do that here so much, but we got to be careful that we don't, you know, apply the, the, although the board is different every year, so that would create some reason why you could apply slightly different standards. And I mean slightly different standards. Um, but. I think Bills is a great place. Uh, I like it there. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had a beer there, to be honest with you, though, for whatever reason. I just I go for, for chicken wings. Um, but we, put, we took great care when we set it up to change, when you folks came to us and we set up to change the, the floor layout and everything, uh, to try to separate the two and all. Uh, I know the bartender you're talking about, and I think she's fabulous. And, you know, some things happen, and, it's unfortunate that you know, everyone's talking about it, but 
Uh, I don't think it was, uh, you know, for lack of caring or lack of interest in doing the job properly. So I'm okay with just letting everybody know that there's one get out of jail card on the table, I guess, tonight. Um, but I don't think, you know, six months from now it happens again, then it wouldn't be the same situation. Yeah, I think certainly there are different factors, um, you know, looking into how long a business uh, has had their liquor license and, you know, run clean, you know, if it was a new license holder and it was a month into their ownership and something like this happens, then everybody needs to step back and maybe reassess what's going on. Yeah. Um, but certainly with the long track record that Bills has, uh, you know, I've already stated my opinion on the rest. So. Th through the chain, yes. if, if, just to be clear, this, this is not a public hearing on this issue. Mm -hmm. What the board is doing tonight is simply receiving a report from the mm -hmm. police chief and then evaluating the, the, the report provided by the chief. Okay. So this is, I just want to make sure that people understand that this is If we were going to take some action or we're, if we were inclined to take yes. some action, we would have to call for a public, public hearing. hearing. Right. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I'm not inclined to call for a public hearing. Do you have a second yeah. on that? I'm inclined to call yeah. for no action, with the exception of that. No I, think if we just, yeah, I think if we just don't, don't move for any kind of a public yeah. hearing at a future yeah. date, then yeah. we're good. Okay, so no action? Excellent. I'm just uh, what what just pleases me, even though we're not having a public hearing, is that you took the initiative immediately, saw the seriousness of it, and um, I, you know didn't wait for us to to um, ask for a public hearing and to and to order uh, the tips train. So thank you very much for uh, taking it so seriously. I I just want to add um, that it be you know clear throughout the town that. I would think with each instance the board retains the right to handle each instance individually because as Mr. Herr mentioned there was another one where I believe there was a suspension. I would not want to send the message that everybody standard procedure you get one get out of, get out of jail free card that would make everyone less diligent mm -hmm. and less on their toes um, that each individual individual case is handled on its individual merits and the board retains the right to impose penalties are not based on the circumstances of the time <coughs> okay with that thank you very much Governor chief thank you very thank you. much thank for the report and for the record, I was not aware that they serve chicken wings. I only go for salads. <laughs> they have really good pizza, too. <laughs> They're boneless, too. Oh, yeah. really good. <laughs> I get them for lunch. Okay. If, if I may, I, I, I know the chief was very humble and modest and really did not outline the process that he follows. I think it needs to be said um, that his program is based on a well-publicized notice that is shared with the community. I think that's good for pub, uh, public relations. Uh, and secondly, he also makes public the fact that he is going to be doing the compliance checks. And I think what that does is it simply sends the strongest message that serving alcohol to young, uh, young people or minors is not acceptable in this community. And I think his team needs to be commended for that. Excellent. Thank you. And Thank also you. that we're all on the, the board and the chief are on the same page in its level of severity and seriousness that we take. Um, you know, just because these guys got a kind of a, a, a warning or an eye opening, it doesn't mean that, it, like you said, it doesn't mean that everybody else is going to. And we back the chief uh, when it comes to stuff like this. We back our public officials that we have in there. Uh, so uh, it's important for everybody to know how, that we do back our chiefs. Okay. Um, trying to catch up. All right, Mr. Kamalo, let's uh, go to the uh, draft budget capital plan discussion. Yes, um, following the previous board discussions of the proposed FY19 budget, uh, tonight we do have the IT department and school department to present their capital projects to the board. So. Good evening. Can I go with IT first or with the school department? Once 
if we're going IT. Oh, we're good to go IT. Yes, okay. yeah. Hopefully, okay. hopefully, it's not getting millions of okay. millions, millions of dollars. Yes. Josh up first. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. The Information Technology Department has three items submitted um, for capital expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the first was originally submitted for forty-five thousand. $500, which was for town hall security upgrades. Um, since the original submission, this capital item has been uh, adjusted down from uh, comprising of three sub projects, uh, eliminating two of those projects, putting those on hold uh, potentially for a future year. Uh, that brings the cost to $20,000 which allows for key card access to be added to all exterior doors at Town Hall um, and combining that into the existing card access control system uh, that exists at the police station, library, and DPW. What's being pushed out? Um, we had also originally recommended one camera, one external camera. Um, be mounted externally on the building, external door, um, to monitor each of the exterior doors. And we also originally recommended internal wiring to be run to internal doors that we thought um, in the future may be recommended to also add interior card access. Um, the primary reason that we were recommending the internal wiring at this point um, was because the walls are already opened up um, due to the water damage prior to putting the sheetrock up, um, we'd be able to recognize a, a savings running yeah. those wires now as, a, as opposed to in the future. Yeah, and so what kind of savings would we, would we be looking at? What's, what are the prices and the price differences? Um, so it, 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 it's hard to say roughly. exactly, yeah. but um, yeah. roughly by doing that wiring now, we'd be looking at um, a range of approximately $8,000 to $10,000 and we believe that by doing that, once the drywall was up, we'd be looking at a premium of roughly seven to eight thousand dollars. On top of that, in addition to uh, being one step closer to having a wiring scheme like what was in there when they took the walls and ceilings down. <laughs> yeah, and what, I use scheme very loosely. <laughs> So, so that was so that's uh, you said eight to ten thousand dollars that we're saving right now, and then the other well, three cameras, the other three cameras were going to be around fifteen thousand, five thousand apiece. Correct. Okay. So, uh, do we have to at uh, five thousand apiece? Do we do we have to go with that high end of camera? Can we just go with a? I'm not telling to tell you what to. But, but you know, is there, you know, like the cameras that they have in stores or in, you know, other businesses that, um, you know, at least there's a camera there that's maybe a little quality or something. Um, there are certainly different levels of, of cameras and, and functions. Um, the class of system that we're looking at is quite different from something that you may install. Um, Kind of buying from a Best Buy at home and, and putting a camera out at your front door, um, where you're maybe recording on loop for 12 hours or 36 hours. This is a um, enterprise class system that's fully integrated to a central server at our police station, and gives us the ability to federate this video with other local state um, agencies. So just so I understand, it was listed as 45.5, and it's dropped down to 20, or 45 re represents the 20 reduction already? Um, Did you say no, the 45.5 the was the original yeah. um, submission, which included all three projects. Uh -huh. It's now been adjusted to 20,000, which accounts for only the key card access to the exterior doors. Okay, so the total is now 20,000 instead of 45.5. Correct. Right. I'm okay. not sure if we're looking for comments and recommendations at this point or if we're just listening. 
but personally my recommendation I'm going to give it anyway would be you know okay if we hold off on the cameras but I think we should at least be doing the wiring I mean we're looking at paying twice as much to get the wiring done uh, if we wait for you know if drywall ever goes up in that building uh, you know it just seems to make sense it, I'm not sure exactly what wiring we're doing that's going to co cost eight to ten thousand uh, dollars because I would think with walls down you got to be putting up a lot of wire <laughs> uh, to, to have it cost that much when the walls are down um, but if it's going to cost twice as much once walls are up I, I think we should not be that short-sighted and we should do it Agreed. and if we want to wait for the cameras you know and wait for the cameras till next year uh, if everybody feels okay about that then that's fine so this is a capital item but is it in the pay-as-you-go or is it a separate that is right, yeah, it's 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 pay as you go. Okay. <clears throat> no, is that it? Well, my only question is so this is for fiscal year 19. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be in town hall then, anyway? Is that what your question is? My question is that, like, <laughs> do you think that the town hall will be done in fiscal year 19? Because there's probably a lot of stuff to the town hall that if we're not going to be in it, then push it off. In, 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 in fact, we, we leave that to Dave. Where's Dave? Yeah. Dave, I mean, based on how the board responds to this request, Dave, Dave can work out his magic and get it I done. I would that's think specific that, to the request. We're talking yes. about generally where are we with town hall? Are we going to be in there? <laughs> yeah. We need to spend the money this year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, if, we're, if we're not going to be in town hall for fiscal year 19, if we're not going to be in there by then, if, if there's we're probably not, a lot of stuff that we can... If we're not going to be putting drywall up at all during fiscal year 19, that is a signal to me that that building needs so much work that we should be getting rid of it, honestly. Well, you know, so... <laughs> we can we can have Dave come and talk to us about yeah. that, but you know if if we're not even putting drywall up by the end of fiscal year nineteen, then that building, I I'd, I'd feel bad that I even brought my kids in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> must so, have been in rough shape. So in in, in risk of having a her Sestari style argument, with you, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would I I guess I would. And I know yeah, start with, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh -uh. Um, and, and I don't know if this is the platform to, to bring it up, but I don't understand when we're, when we're in the middle of this, this uh, town hall project. I know, like, I don't understand why, if a homeowner has an insurance claim, and let's say a water pipe breaks in their, in their home, and it goes down and floods everything, and they got to get new whatever the insurance company less your deductible huh. has to bring you to the code of where you are now on a on a home and I don't know about commercial but I'm saying on a homeowners I know this because I had a similar incident at my house that I bought that I tore down when insurance came and looked at it they said well we can't replace knob and tubing electrical you have to put an entire new service on it. And by the way, we're paying for it. We have to pay for it because we can't have you rebuild not to code. So I don't know why this doesn't translate to a commercial insurance, and maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm way off base. I don't work in the insurance business. But if, so if this water main break and water pipe breaks and, and all this stuff is damaged, the insurance should not pay to get things done that's not to code because it's not gonna pass your building inspections. So I'm, if I'm way off, I'm way off, but um, I don't know why there's so much time taking on getting this thing back. As, as a selectman of someone who grew up in town that has a lot of pride in town, this is a great studio, but I gotta be honest with you, I want my selectman's meetings at the town hall, not here. And it kinda sucks having the, the, the meetings here when we should be having them at the town hall because that's our town building. Mr. Ted Stone, I can assure you that De Dave and his team will really make Town Hall great. Okay. 
again. They're going to make hard <laughs> yes, oh, wow. he, they, they are. And specifically in terms of the question that has been asked, we still expect to be back in town hall uh, by May of this year. As of right now, if you were a town hall, you'd have seen lots of people coming in and out of the building. We have electricians already working. Uh, we expect the, the drywalling uh, uh, companies to come in uh, as early as next week. So work is going on. If, if, you, if you were a town hall this week, you, you, you would have noticed. So yeah. Well, so now I have another question then. If we're talking about in fiscal year 19 doing wiring pre-drywall, budgeting for wiring pre-drywall, but drywall is going in next week, how does that happen? Davis makes it happen. <laughs> Do one side. Exactly. Yeah. It. Okay. yeah. So they're not doing all the drywall. The so, so based, based on that information, yeah. I would support Mr. Sestari's suggestion yeah. that we go ahead and support this article with the wiring only and the cameras at the next year. Yeah. Yeah. So just while we're talking about this, I know it's a love topic, but because Mr. Tedson was brought up, we've been discussing. I had more people ask me what's going on with Town Hall, and I really can't answer them because I don't really understand, and we're kind of going around now. I mean, I would love for people who are watching to have a quick rundown of where we are, why we're here, and where we're going. Because, you know, I haven't been able to answer that question, and I feel I should. Here's the simple answer. We are where we are because over the years, the town did not invest in a fire suppression system okay. for our most valued town hall. After the water damage, we had a series of meetings with our wonderful fire department, as well as the consultant who works with the town on fire suppression issues. Mm -hmm. We worked out a plan, and most people who have done fire suppression systems for fire buildings know very well how costly this is. And so, Dave, spend a lot of time putting together a bid package that he felt would be the cheapest for the community. That doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It took a series of bids to get to that point. He eventually did. Now he has a plan, a fire suppression system for the building, acceptable to the fire department, supported and approved by our fire consultant, and Dave has found a way to pay for it. So That's why it took longer okay. to get everybody back. And now being that in the commercial construction business for 30 yes. years, I completely get that. Yeah. So but to her question, I'm kind of, when are we yes. moving in? <laughs> I, I thought I said this five minutes ago. But, but, but going in back general, in end of May. Okay. You never said it. Exactly. You yeah. did. No, you yeah. did. Yeah. Yes, I said it five now. minutes ago. <laughs> no, you said it recently. Yeah. 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 Yes, he did. Okay. okay. And in addition, pay attention. In addition, right now I'm happy to say if you go to town hall, there are people working. It's the electricians. They are doing the wiring, and we're hoping next week, the firm that will be doing the the the, the drywalling uh, will also be in place doing the work. So we are now going full steam ahead. And remember too, okay. this is not our project. In fact. The, the insurance company was chomping at the beast, they wanted to move ahead, but we, we told them not to because we wanted to address the fire suppression system. So, so the, um, this eight to ten thousand dollar wiring, what functionality is that supporting? This gives us the in wall wiring that would be required to add card access control readers to interior doors in the future. Okay. So there might be a dozen doors or 20 doors in the building. And once you've gotten in the outer perimeter of the building, we want to know who's getting into town clerk's office or town manager's office or whatever. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. That's all I have on that one. Yeah. I if do have a question on one of the other IT items, but I'll let us all yeah, finish if this first. Through the chair, if I may also yeah. throw in a plug for Dave. 
I'm hoping we can share with you how much the town paid for similar systems at DPW and the library compared to what Dave has negotiated for this similar system at town hall. For the card access system? Yes. <coughs> so, if I may, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, so what, in the end, what kind of money are we talking about? We talked about 45.5, then it was down to 20. We talked about an eight to ten thousand dollar wiring. We also talked about cameras, three cameras of fifteen thousand. Um, so the 45, where, what, what the 45.5 is, is coming down to 30 if we include the wiring right okay, now. Okay, so Josh had reduced it to 20, and we're saying if we do the wiring now, which we should, that would bump it up to between eight and ten. So we'd be looking at 30 instead of 20 and instead of 45.5. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, server upgrade. Uh, the second submission is for a public safety server upgrade. This is to replace uh, infrastructure that resides at the police department's um, server room. This runs um, servers that support both public safety, uh, police, <coughs> and fire. Uh, the hardware that we have in place right now is over eight years old and is at a point in its life where we're having compatibility issues in terms of what versions of VMware, which is the, the virtualization layer, um, that we're able to run on top of that hardware. And um, that then leads to compatibility issues between the version of VMware that we're able to run to the version of Windows Server, which we're able to run. And we're now at a point where both the version of VMware and the Windows environment that are running um, have both been end of life for a number of years. Um, so this is putting us in a bind in terms of some software compatibility issues and, and upgrades that we're not able to do, um, independent of the fact that we just, we have eight-year-old hardware. Um, running mission critical public safety infrastructure. Anybody have any questions on the uh, server? Other than time between now and fiscal year 19, what's preventing us from moving the functionality from these servers to the cloud? So we've already moved um, any of the low hanging fruit that we're able to in terms of services from public safety to the cloud. Um, these are these are core servers that um, <coughs> still need to, to reside locally to support the Windows environment that exists within the public safety offices, um, as well as giving us the ability to have enhanced functionality from cruisers and um, public safety vehicles in terms of remote connectivity. Okay. Um, if we were If we were to, I guess, have we already investigated the possibility, yeah, understanding that it may be a very complex uh, project, um, but the future possibility of uh, getting rid of these servers and moving everything over to the cloud. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is if we do this now, um, you know, should we be looking at, you know, how, how complex would that next step be? Would it be something that no more than two years from now, we start planning and pricing and figuring out exactly what needs to happen so that by the time those hit end of life, uh, you know, we're able to move on it. Um, you know, I'm just trying to get an idea. How many, how many years do you think it would take us to, to fully get off of this? Um, r respectfully, I, I don't believe that we would ever be in that situation. Um, you call that respectful? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll always need some level of local computing environment um, to support um, this type of setup as it exists today and, and for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I don't see us in a time frame of even five to six years from now being in a position to completely eliminate the hardware infrastructure that's required to run um, those two buildings. Okay. 
I'd like to talk to you about that offline. Yeah, I don't think everybody needs to. Ab absolutely. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Okay. How much is this item? 60000 <clears throat> Okay, and use hardware replacement. Uh, this is the third and final submission from the IT department for capital fiscal 19 for $35,000. Uh, this is just for the ongoing uh, replacement of end user computing devices, laptops and desktops. I, I just want to ask, do we have to have that? I, right now, I'll tell you where, we're, where we are. I'm looking at every single thing that's <coughs> called replacement or upgrade or study um, and just taking a really hard look as do we really have, do we have to do it this year? Um, how many, how many uh, PCs is that? 20, 20 25, something um, like that? No, this would get us 30 desktops 30. and six laptops. Uh, in addition to 18 monitors. Okay. How many How many do we have in our entire arsenal? So uh, what percentage of everything that you're supporting is this? Um, Roughly. That's, that's less than 25%. Um, our full fleet of laptops and desktops is approximately 160. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 100 desktops and about 60 laptops. So we're looking at roughly... Uh, four to five year lifespan for each one of these that costs around a thousand dollars. Approximately, yes. At at a thirty five thousand um, dollar per year replacement cycle, at the cost that we're currently paying, that um, forces us to go to a useful life of five point seven five years for a desktop and four point two five years. For a laptop, mm -hmm. and these are uh, true, uh, you know, computers and laptops. They're not, they're not like Chromebooks or something like that that need to be connected. C correct. Okay. Um, and even if we even if we went to something like that, the most we're going to save is, you know, a couple hundred bucks per item. And you know, I mean, I don't see that it's worth, you know, starting to. Get down to those pennies at this point. <coughs> Thank you. Anybody have anything else? Wait. Thank you very much for coming in, Josh. Thanks, Thank Josh. you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. <coughs> Schools. Welcome. Thanks for coming. So you're wanting us to go through our capital? If you would, please. Is that correct? Okay. Do you have a preference for order? Or you want no. Me to it's start? It's I'm going to start at the top of your list. Um, so in all of our um, all of our capital projects have been reviewed and approved by CIC. So that's where we are in the process. <clears throat> and just a quick reminder, as we discussed at our meeting on Thursday, we will be taking another look at our capital articles what's today this coming thursday is today thursday tuesday okay um so that said where we are right now we have our turf field project um on the um on the warrant and i get we came in december i think and gave you an update since then the project has gone out to bid we're waiting for the bids to come back so we'll know exactly what the cost is going to be um, but as a reminder, we do have $1.7 million from CPC. We're in the process of securing um, community funding. In fact, right now in a different meeting in a different part of town, we're um, engaging a group to manage um, some kind of a GoFundMe-like campaign. And we have been working to identify some, um, some sponsors as well. So. We actually didn't have a quorum at our last turf field subcommittee meeting, but we were going to discuss having a goal of at least $500,000 in community funds to raise towards this project as well. So all of that is ongoing, and um, as soon as we know what the final cost will be, we will reach out to um, town hall so we can get an actual tax impact, and then we'll really know what 
what we're talking about in terms of a dollar amount as well as if it's going to impact FY19 or FY20. So I'll keep you up to date as soon as we get more information on all of those things. When, when you're doing the tax impact, can mm -hmm. you make sure that you include the CPC money in that? Yeah. Um, cause Take, it, you mean? That, that's tax money. Yes, So we should I know. be including that. Well, maybe it makes sense to do it both ways. So you're right, because it's tax money that's already been collected. And could go it, to other projects. But it's not incremental. It's not incremental. So maybe it makes sense to do it both ways. Yeah, at the very least. Okay. Yeah. Does yeah. that, okay, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Um, any other questions on that one? Are you going to move on? I'm moving. Okay. Okay. Um, so next is dishwasher for a cafeteria. I, I guess I do have one more question on yep. that. Um, so we've been having a couple really difficult uh, meetings and discussions on the budget and the situation we're in on the whole. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we're, well, we all know the situation. Right. Are you, are you still kind of looking at how all of this turns out and how we get there before you make a final determination? of whether you're going to go forward and recommend this uh, in front of town meeting? Or is this something that you've all decided that regardless of how ugly the, the operating budget is, uh, it's, it's a go forward and request this of the taxpayers? I mean, I hope you think that we're better community partners than that. I, absolutely, all of this is, is stuff that we're continuing to discuss and consider at all of our meetings. I think, you know, my only point tonight is that we're about to have a great deal more of final information and data than we have right now. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to consider that, have the full context of what the cost is going to be as well as what year it will impact the tax rate as well as what where we are at that point with the operating budget but i think it's also important just like you i know you guys have um you know the downtown corridor project you have offsets for that i'm sure I, I don't know if the cpc funds continue or if we would have to go back and apply again so i also want to make sure i'm sure the committee wants to make sure that we're also not giving away um you know an offset we're not losing that opportunity as well. So all of those things are things that we're continuing continuing to look at. Have we had a vote that we don't care about anything else and we're going to go forward no matter what? Of course not. Mm -hmm. So let me just jump in real quick because I think we're getting a little bit off kilter here with the CPC piece of this puzzle. CPA was passed at the, at, you know, in Boston and supports <coughs> communities across the state for this very reason. In difficult budget years, what do communities do across Massachusetts? They stop investing in their communities because they can't afford to. The CPA and CPC here in Hopkinton was put in place for this very reason. So we continue to invest in the community while we do battle with other budget issues. And so I think it's, I think it's, we gotta be careful not to sort of go after CPA or CPC or tax money in general, because then you're going after the very nature and reason the program exists in the first place. Thanks for that lesson. Um, that's not You're where my comments. Welcome. That's not where my comments were coming from, though. My comments were coming from the fact that we're having a very difficult budget process. Um, we think that we've gotten off the ledge of the possible override, but even without an override, it looks like there's a possibility if the budget stays where it, where it is that rather than increasing taxes two and a half percent we may be taxing upwards of 5% or more. Right. Uh, and doing that, in addition to uh, the possibility of uh, the uh, debt that we're already paying off from other projects and purchases that town meeting had approved over the last few years, and then adding another project like this, um, in my mind, is not considerate and it's very contradictory to much of what we talk about when we're trying to give taxpayers and in particular the senior citizens in town more of a tax break so i just want us to be looking at this holistically i don't want us to just look at the operating budget and then say okay once we get that you know where it's somewhat palatable to us we can forget the rest and just let everybody vote on it at town meeting and then maybe you know the right group 
has the right amount of people at town meeting to pass something, this impacts everybody. You know, and we have to go back to that one community thing and one budget, and let's take a look at the whole thing. So if we can get an asset for three and a half million dollars with the taxpayers kicking in additionally five hundred thousand dollars, you wouldn't support that. It's not, if if I may between you two, it's I don't not. Think we're, it's not yeah. we, everybody keeps forgetting about the people think that CPC money is free, and it's that extra line on everybody's tax bill that that people just forget about. It's like oh, it's it's free money. now. Now the other money that we it was brought up about. Um, uh, for for the for the roads project that came in for, that 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 was a money that came in from uh, Legacy Farm that was specifically set to do work for roads, and um, you know and that that's not that wasn't taxed money, you know when, when we're talking about using up uh, you know, almost an entire fund that's why we, again you you just did the same thing we're separating separating the issues so five hundred thousand plus two hundred plus three point eight. Plus 2.1, and then we we get something. But if we keep telling everybody, oh, I'm going to take this out of this pocket, we're going to take this out of this pocket, and then you're going to get something great. And it's a great thing to have. But I'm wondering, to Mr. Sestari's point, if if this this if this is the year, or, or you know, are, are enough people going to be able to speak to it? Yeah, I mean, my my comment on the CPC stuff is, first of all, this may be the exact right project mm -hmm. for the money to go into. But if it's not, it's not that it's not going to go toward the community. Not all the money needs to get spent every year. You know, it can go to other projects in future years, or it could go to this project in a future year. Um, but so far, the numbers I've heard have been 3.8 million, uh, 1.7 coming from CPC. That gets it down to 2.1 million. The only money that I've heard that isn't really taxpayer money is possibly a goal of 500,000 of, of you know independent community support so that's 500,000 out of 3.8 million it's not it's not only an additional five hundred thousand dollars of taxpayer money so I don't want things to get clouded there all I'm saying is that you know we all and, and I understand that you know Gene is saying that you know they're still looking at everything and I appreciate that but we all have uh, w what I think is a responsibility to um, not just go and you know put projects in front of town meeting and see if it'll fly or with the hope that it'll fly or something like that but we have more of a responsibility than that uh, and, and our responsibility is to uh, put financially responsible items in front of town meeting things that we think are sustainable and that will help move the town forward and make it better without breaking the backs of, of the citizens so that's all I'm getting to. And I have no question that, that the school committee will be doing that. And, you know, I, but I just want to get that out on the table for everybody to hear. I, I want to add, um, you know, to Mr. Sestar's comments, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but if I in interpret what he's saying, um, I don't feel there's any inference, nor should there be, that, um, you know, the school committee presenting this doesn't care about the community. I think everybody understands that we're all in a tough spot right now. And from what I, I've followed this project to some extent, and from what I've seen, it you put it, there's been a lot of work put in, and it's been thought out. I went to some of the CPC meetings last year when it was decided that it wasn't the year, and some of the meetings this year, there was a very excellent <coughs> EHOP presentation in the fall. It was very well presented, and I think the case was very well made for it. However, um, you know, unfortunately, looking at our budgets, we find ourselves in a different position in February than we were in October or even December when we started really looking at the numbers and getting this new information. And I know I spent a lot of time poring over the budgets and realizing that the one of the big issues is, is debt. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard number. It's, it's a fixed cost. And it's just the killer. Um, when you look at how much our, and, and really drove home the point of a debt exclusion, is we're all saying, well, this is excluded from all these other restrictions of two and a half, and maybe nobody really understood what exclusion means till all of a sudden it shows up in your tax bill and people sure. go, what's this? You say, well, you excluded that from all these other, all these other um, control measures that we thought <clears throat> we had. Mm -hmm. And that's why 
I know I ha right now I'm looking at every single one of these capital articles through a new lens now and particularly if it's going to add to our debt because um, it's just devastating right now and you yeah. know that's where I think we all have to be coming from um, it's a new day yeah no I agree and I mean certainly we voted on this a long <laughs> before the news got as dire as it is and yeah. it isn't lost on us but you know I think Todd what you just said really jumped out at me and I think it's a, a very succinct way to, to wrap up what we are trying to do with this project you said that you you know you're looking for things that are sustainable and make the town better and this this is a, a project that is on the school capital warrant article but this is a community asset we have an MOU with Parks and Rec so that we are operating this jointly with them there's an, a great deal of community use we're setting up a revolving fund so that it will pay for its own maintenance and it will offset the cost of replacing the fields. It solves a problem for the schools in terms of usage hours and weather, which complicates our seasons for our athletes. So, you know, it is something that's solving a need on the town side as well as the school side. And I absolutely, we all understand very clearly how difficult a year this is. And, and it may be that the town will say we can't afford this right now, but all we're saying at this point, or all I'm saying at this point, is we're very close to having much more actual factual data about it that we feel it's important to review, and we're asking for the time to do that. The bids are coming in. Um, what's the date today? 13. Okay, so by next week, I think we're reviewing them as a subcommittee on the 26th right after the school vacation and then we expect to review the bid as a school committee I think on the March 1st agenda so we're very close to knowing more about what the actual cost is to the town but I think the other piece that's very important is to understand is this project going to hit the FY19 taxes or the FY20 taxes and you know we're all talking about doing some projections and looking out a few years about what the picture looks like and I, I just think that that is a relevant piece of information to look at so yeah so so one other thing that we talked about at, uh, at the meeting when you came to give us the latest on this was the possibility of exploring where that revolving fund is paying the debt service um, to pay for the construction of the field and not just saving it up for replacement of the field understanding that there would likely have to be some type of ramp up period right um, has that been explored in any I mean, detail? You would have to direct that question to Norman. I don't know. We don't. I think you have the article to set up the revolving fund, but I do think that that's a very good suggestion. If that's a possibility, I mean, I feel like that's a conversation with Norman and Parks and Rec and the finance directors. It's way above my pay grade to answer your question, but mm -hmm. I think that that's an excellent suggestion, and I think that's a little bit of a different. Um, it's a kind of a creative approach that I don't know that we've done. Maybe we have done it before, but that is basically how we financed the um, project that we did when we um, fixed the bleachers and everything at the football field. That was a project that the town borrowed the money, but the BAA and HAA or 26.2 paid the debt service on it, so it actually never was on the tax rolls. Right. So I understand what you're saying. That was not through a revolving fund, so I don't know <coughs> if the rules are different, but um, I, I think that that's a great question to pursue. So I don't know the answer, but I would like to know it as well. Okay. okay. You know, th what, I like, what I liked about this one was at least we spent time on the, on the biggest one on there. <laughs> But when we spend 15 minutes talking about the eight thousand dollars so at least <laughs> at least the public gets to see that uh, when something comes up that's almost four million we, we talked about it you know great. the message is there this year everything mm -hmm. counts yep yes okay dishwasher the dishwasher so that this counts too. <laughs> this is for um this is a project for the middle school to um to install a dishwasher and that so again this is one that we'll be taking up again on Thursday. That's in pay as you go, and that's what we had talked about at our last joint meeting. Um, the stage one, uh, sorry, any questions about the dishwasher? Okay. What are they using right now? They um, are using disposable everything, and so the dishwasher would um, mean that they wouldn't have to buy all the disposable trays and whatnot, right? 
So there's not a dishwasher right now. There used to be. And the, co the annual cost of the disposable stuff is roughly? Off the top of my head, I don't know. I can get no. you the answer to the question. No. Okay. Um, the Campus Road Master Plan. So this is a study that we're doing of the um, high school and middle school campus in an effort to solve a couple of problems. One is that um, when we, we were told in um, <coughs> August that we couldn't have parent pickup on Hayden Row anymore for the high school because <coughs> the traffic calming <coughs> measures were going to be implemented and I guess there's been a delay in that but I'm sure they're still going to happen at some, at some point soon. So we need to move the parent pickup traffic onto the high school campus if we can because um, they can no longer queue on Hayden Row. So that combined with the need that we've all talked about in terms of the bus park parking lot, um, we're doing a study to see um, if we can solve all of those problems on the high school campus. So uh, we have not seen the results of the study yet, but my understanding is one thing that we're looking at is paving what is now Field 9, which is the field directly behind the cafeteria at the high school. And that could be the bus parking lot. So then we would get the excise taxes back for the town um, if we were able to park the buses here. Um, I know it's also something that the Irvine Todaro um, committee has looked at, and I, I, you're on that committee. Yes, I, I don't know that they've reached a conclusion. Oh, either, no, we, the, no, the Irvine Todaro's uh, full. There was a it was a, a unanimous to. Uh, um, that was the only thing that Irvine Todaro. Um, uh, took action on yeah. because uh, we didn't want to uh, do anything until after the school was built except for the school bus parking. Right. I think what I meant was I don't know that there's been an exploration of the location or the cost or anything like that. But um, and that was going to be a temporary solution, right? But it was it was one it was you know, we didn't want to pave it. It was going to be you know done gravel or something. Gravel, right. Yeah, but knowing that we might have other use for that, for that property at mm -hmm. some other point. Okay. So that one anyway is um, has uh, has been designated as a bond article. Then uh, the next one is HVAC replacements district wide. That is currently listed as pay as you go, and we can take that up again on Thursday. Although I did um, check with our finance director today, and she said that. They are failing, and so moving it out of pay as you go will most likely move it into our operating budget. So I'm not, it's not necessarily a win there. Um, she said the same thing for the walk in freezer and ref excuse me, walk in refrigerator and freezer, those are also failing. That was a twenty thousand dollar article that's in pay as you go. Uh, the next article is the air conditioning at the middle school auditorium. Um, that's listed as a barn, excuse me, a bond article for $200,000. This is one that probably seems familiar to you. It's been on our capital spreadsheet a couple of times and, um, and been postponed or we did part of the work and then, uh, and then learned that the bid wasn't correct and it wasn't enough to do all of it. And so this has been hanging around for a while. So which, um, I guess kind of jumping back a little bit, the other HVAC replacements district wide um, what are they covering as opposed to obviously not the middle school auditorium. not the middle school auditorium that one's on the roof this is um, in the, in the buildings like um, <laughs> I'm not your girl for this <laughs> for maintenance I can get back to you if you want um, but yeah All right. more for for the internal parts of the buildings okay. not on the roof units um, let's see and then the next one uh, security upgrades, cameras, um, that is... Can the town have your old ones? <laughs> we don't have any. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, that is listed as a bond article as well, and this is for um, cameras, cameras around the schools and on the loop road. Uh, then technology upgrades, we have already reduced this. This is in pay as you go as well. We've already reduced this. Um, so it's something that we can take up again on Thursday. Uh, the wetlands order of conditions, um, that is 
something that came to light as we were starting to go through the permitting process of for the turf fields. It's not related to the turf field project, but it is a holdover obligation or a, a pre-existing obligation that the town had from the building of the high school and the middle school fields, um, or not the middle school fields, the fields down um, by H lot. So it's something that precedes, if you can believe it, my tenure here um, that, we, that we weren't aware of that came to light. So this is just an obligation that, that we have that needs to be extinguished. Um, and again, it isn't related to the turf fields. We didn't put it in the turf field project because it is an obligation that needs to be taken care of. And if the turf field project were to <coughs> be removed or not to pass, then it would mean that we wouldn't be able to do that. So that's why you say, uh, see it as a separate item. And then. So on that wetlands order of conditions, that $100,000, is that, so do we need to like recreate wetlands? Yes. Yeah, it's a replication for um, from when those fields were built. Um, and so we were able to get our um, project designer on the turf fields to work with the Conservation Commission agent on a general idea of how that would work. And the CONCOM reviewed the original outstanding order. Um, that was supposed to be a one to two replication and they've re reviewed it and determined that a one to 1.5 would be sufficient. So it is a smaller area that we need to do, but it's all been planned so that um, it doesn't impact, it doesn't, the if the turf field construction goes forward, it doesn't impact that at all. Um, so they can be done separately from each other. And this, again, it's just, we would like to take care of it so that it doesn't get dropped and so come to light in 20 more years. Uh, you know, I don't know how it didn't get completed in the first place, but that so preceded all of us. We're, are we going to get fined if we don't do this? Because it, it, if it's been hanging out there for 20 years, I got no problem pushing it off for another 20. The frogs are fine. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, I, I, no disrespect to any of the work that you guys have done, but if, uh, if, if CONCOM has let it go for these first 20 years, uh, and it was was a hundred thousand dollars twenty years ago. Uh, no, that's that's a current right. estimate. I don't. I, oh, okay. They they. Um, I don't think they've known about it for twenty years. I think it came to light as part of the conversation around this project, yeah. and um, so they would also like to see it taken care of um, sooner rather than later because it's so long outstanding. And again, because. You know, people change. We're all volunteers that get elected or not reelected, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, you know, so before we all switch seats, I think they just like to make sure that it take it gets taken care of. Um, any other questions about that one? Okay, and then the final one um, <coughs> are AEDs. So the athletic director has come to us with a concern that. Um, we do not have enough AEDs to cover, to adequately cover um, our sports teams in terms of how spread out they are on our campus. As you know, several of our teams have to now play offsite at Fruit Street. Um, so this article would provide enough AEDs so that every team, every coach could have one. They're trained to use them already, so there isn't a cost for that. but. Um, so that they would be able to have an AED with them um, in case it was needed. Um, Mr. Kamal, do we have them in, in our public buildings? Some. And in fact, um, we, we could work with the, with the school superintendent on, on potential grants. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it, then there's, you know, this, with the state buying power and all that, but I think we should make sure if that's something that's real important that we have in all of our buildings so people feel safe when they're going through. Yeah. Sure, but if there's a less expensive way to do it, that would be wonderful, obviously. That would be great. Um, Jean, you said the technology upgraded 165,000 um, had been reduced. Is 165 the reduced number? Or yes. It, oh, okay. Yeah. So that's not getting reduced further. That that's the new number. That yes, we reduced that. All right. What um, are some of the things included in that? A while ago, 
It's the general, you can help me out. Um, it's for servers, equipment like that, and um, honestly, I'm, I'm not gonna give you the right answer. Uh, let, me, let me send you an email tomorrow, I'm sorry. The, unfortunately, Kathy's out of the district or she would be here giving you the correct and full answers, and I just am That's not fine. as conversant with the details as she is. Well, to that question, though, I mean, I keep looking at words like upgrades, and, you know, we asked Josh about technology upgrades, mm -hmm. and he, you know, explained and justified that the things are, you know, on their last legs or they're not compatible anymore. So, you know, we're always looking at wants versus needs, and everybody wants upgrades and the latest and the greatest, but then the question is always, what can we do level this year and put some of these things off? Do you know where those upgrades fall? Are these things that are just dire, or are they just improvements that maybe we can get by not making this year? Yeah, and what I'm struggling with is I'm not sure if um, there there is a lot of what drives our technology budget is the technology that's required for state testing. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm just not positive if that's what's in this capital article or if that's also in our, op if that's in our operating budget. Mm -hmm. So that's why I want to get um, a more informed answer from Kathy. And I can send it to you in the morning um, what's exactly. Typically, um, we've done this for the last several years and we've had joint IT articles when we did cable in the town. And um, so, We've sort of had an article for about $200,000 for several years in a row, but we did take a look this year and reduce it as much as we thought, as you know, as Ashok thought that we could. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm not doing a very good job of telling you what's in there, so I, I will send you that. Yeah. Um, and you also wanted to know about the HVAC, so I'm just making a note for myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm curious on the HVAC. I know you said there's one at the middle school that really, that's that's failing, but are they all fail? How, how much, I wanna know on all these items, what's, what's an absolute necessity and what's Yeah, a, so you just want a, a better breakdown of those two yeah, I'm, for I'm, what, what's actually in them. I, I can, I cannot <laughs> provide it, but I can make it happen okay. tomorrow, sorry. Anything that says upgrade. And I just wanna go, if, if, if I may, to go back to the, um, uh, $320,000 for the road master plan. Mm -hmm. Do, you know, considering that we've already got the loop road in and there's a, there's a, there's a driveway that heads into where, where we're talking about the parking lot, mm -hmm. people get uh, upset about studies and plans. Could we just put that three hundred twenty thousand dollars into just the building of the parking lot and the and the roads? Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, it's not a. It's the study and the. And oh, okay. Yeah. I just want to be, yeah. We, we, we just clarify that because you know the way it looks like it's this is the study and then next year we're going to build it mm -hmm. because I just want to. So at the end of the day, we're getting something. We're not just getting a, a study that we put on the shelf. There's a built product included. Yeah, in that's there. what I wanted to make sure. There's a product in there. Okay. It, it also has to do with the bus traffic and the way that goes mm -hmm. through and improving that to make it safer. Even though we did have moved traffic off of Hayden Road, there have, it, it hasn't been a perfect system. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix it so that it works better for everybody. We did the best in a short period of time that we could <coughs> for this year, but not really sustainable going forward. But it's going to be built. The, with that 320. We, we haven't seen the results of the right. of the study yet, so that's why we can't yeah. tell you what they're building exactly, but those are the things that have been discussed so far with us. So paving field nine for bus parking, for, well, for a parking lot, bus or staff to move their cars down there. Um, Rerouting so that the buses would go between the middle school and the high school, and so parent pickup could be in, in the bus loop instead of, mm -hmm. Right. It needs to be widened a little bit. It's it needs to be widened a little path. bit. The bus can yeah, make it, but, right. but, um, but it's not, but they want to make it a little bit wider. So no. those, are the, those are the things that have been under review. I just, we haven't seen the results of the study, so I, that's why I don't have the details on it. But it's my understanding that this estimate includes doing that, doing work. Mm -hmm. That's different. Yeah, so, so my, only, my only suggestion is to, maybe we would rename that one a little bit. <laughs> So people understand that, because that's that's something that I got, I was called out on. Sure. I, I another $320,000 plan, really, you guys? Plan and construction. 
Yeah, so that's just we have to or solution. add that. <laughs> and if you, I know you're aware, John, of the amount of money that will come back to the town if, in fact, we can successfully put the buses on our property. It's, it's I think, somewhere in excess of $100,000 in excise taxes. So right. Mm -hmm. Yearly? $100,000 yearly? Like for the buses? Yeah, that's that's good understanding. Ash, that's that's the number that's right been thrown around, yeah. right? That's the number that has been thrown out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 it will be a great savings, yeah, considering how much the bus contracts keep going up every year. There's still, still something. Well, it wouldn't be, our, we wouldn't save the money in our, <laughs> like that money would go directly to the town. Right, yeah, exactly. But I think that we also hopefully would save some money in the mileage mm -hmm. that we pay in the context of our um, contract. So I want to throw in an underwrite for that $100,000 too, Mr. Pumal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not second. It's <laughs> um, all right, so you are. So I will be sending you tomorrow a better breakdown of what's in our IT article, information about the HVAC and the campus road plan. Anything else? And add the work construction. Right. Here. Solution or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh -oh. Okay, sorry. Workman's comp. Salary is zero. Yeah, 80%. <laughs> Mr. Kamalo, uh, annual town meeting articles. Yes, we, we wanted to give the board the opportunity again to um, give us guidance on whether you would like us to move forward with the nuisance bylaw that addresses buildings or the one that does not address buildings. So, um, Mr. Hurt, this was, your, this was your, your baby. I said last time I was not really inclined to look at buildings, so it's still there. Ms. Wright, it looks like you're ready to say something. Well, I would like to know, have we asked our municipal inspections team for any feedback on these articles? And because the enforcement would largely fall on them. So the reason why you see in there or a designee mm -hmm. would be that uh, if at some point they needed to have someone else do code enforcement, right. there could be someone do that other than, right. than the director of municipal inspections. I, but, but do they have any general feelings about the whole concept of these articles and the enforceability or the burden it's going to put on them or putting them, you know, in, in, in the decision-making or their designee of, of, I understand why we're even looking at this. I also have a lot of concerns and sort of slippery slope thoughts about it. Um, do they have any opinion on this whole concept? I think we've discussed it individually. Um, they are not jumping up and down, um, <laughs> and, but if it's something the community wants, I mean, obviously, they'll deal with it. What, what triggers enforcement of this? Is it a complaint, or just if one of the enforcers sees something, then they can just go and enforce it? Because I, over the last couple of weeks, I've driven around town, and I've seen properties that would, without question, fall into this category where it could be enforced. Now, some of the properties that I've seen this on, I know for a fact are, you know, they, the people have been living here longer than Brendan, you know. Um, That's hard, and, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I guess all I'm saying is, what kind of can of worms is this gonna open and are we willing to, are we willing to enforce this? And, and again, what triggers it? So, if someone, if my neighbor complains about something in my backyard and that triggers the enforcement on me and it just ticks me off and I start saying, well, look at this guy across town. I want you to enforce him. Is that enough? Or is it, you know, just one of our inspectors driving around and seeing it? Or does it have to be an abutter who complains? You know, that's, that's some of the questions that I have on this. Along with being a slippery slope in general. Right. Uh, it seems to me if we're going to be uniform across the community, then it's the governmental body or whoever it is that's charged with enforcing. They should be out looking as well as neighbors looking or, or butters looking. But see, this uh, being out looking, I mean, I, I know how we got here. 
and sometimes you take an individual case or a couple cases and then you try to craft a whole s legislative solution around that one case and you're kind of, you've got this tunnel vision thing because you're trying to solve that individual's problem and, and you're not looking at the bigger ramifications and the, implica the implications for the town at large. Um, I worry that sometimes some of these things can end up being used primarily as a weapon at what should really is a neighbor dispute. Um, I can tell you years ago doing dog officer stuff, how many animal complaints came down to a neighbor problem. It really wasn't really the neighbor, the dog problem. It was, it was a neighbor issue. Um, you know, I think the, the law that we, kicked around last year had some very definite penalties for certain things in so many days and it was really draconian and it, it, it kind of um, removed the uh, ability to use some judgment and, and a sense of decency or mercy or understanding in, in addressing individual cases and, and so we pull back on that which I was glad for although that's why I asked about the opinion of the municipal inspector because it's now very gray. Um, I kind of like that, but it also, you know, as Mr. Cesari said, I've, I've walked around and driven around and, you know, one man's junk is another man's treasure. I've seen yards that have all kinds of, you know, uh, piles of brush and stuff, it's a big property, they throw their leaves out back or whatever. I mean, a variety of things could fall into this category if somebody wanted to make a case. Um, and then there's a libertarian side of me that feels some sort of private property rights that, you know, whether you like looking at it or not, who are you to tell me what I can have on my property if it's not a danger to you? Um, I've seen outbuildings, garages and outbuildings that were never intended for habitation. Uh, you know, are we going to start telling them that their work shed has to be brought up to fire code? Um, this is just a tough one. I, um, I think it's a property value issue. Well, you know, I, there's <coughs> lots of stuff in my neighborhood that I could say, you know, it would my it would be nicer if I didn't have to look at that. Maybe the entire house, it would be great if the house wasn't there and I looked at a field. That would really increase my property value. I mean, there's just so many things that it, it really is, you know, the eye of the beholder. And, um, you know, there's people that do small engine repair that have parts outside. And maybe the answer is just to ask them to screen it. Um, I, I just, I This is why they say fences make good neighbors. Right, right. Good fences make good neighbors. I think it raises <laughs> a bad lot fences of questions. Make bad maybe, neighbors. We can, maybe we can try it and find out and then repeal it if it's a disaster. <laughs> if I may, these are the kinds of issues that the inspectors deal with every day. They get mm -hmm. a lot of complaints and they, they observe a lot of things and they try to be very fair and they yeah. deal with people fairly. Uh, quietly to resolve these things. Um, they don't want to embarrass anyone, yes. or but they're very fair and even-handed when it, when it comes to, to these things. And sure. um, they get complaints from many sources, and they mm -hmm. see things too. Mm -hmm. so. so they're they're used to dealing with these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Anybody else have anything on this one? <clears throat> so, what's the purpose of bringing it up tonight? Um, because it's. Uh, it's got a spot on the warrant, mm -hmm. if we so desire. At some point, we need to, if it's going to go forward, town council will get it for review, so if no. we could choose which direction to go in. Yeah. yeah. Well, I gotta say, before I vote to try to move any of this forward, I, I think that we should have, um, you know, the, the town inspectors in here, talking to them about it. Okay. You know, is this, a, is this a tool that they feel that they need to do their jobs? And, you know, if so, uh, you know, is it good the way it is? Do they think that there needs to be modifications? What are the pitfalls that they see? Um, yeah, I'm having a tough time with it the way it is right now, personally. Mr. Paul, is that okay? Can we um, ask yes. them? Yeah, we will invite uh, the town's inspectors to the next board of selectmen meeting. Excellent. Who will that be? Um, it will be Chuck Cadillac, Mike Shepard. 
uh, and any member of their team that they team uh, may need to come before the board. Um, just just a couple things on on the version that does include buildings uh, on page two, item G. So the outdoor storage or accumulation of junk, trash, litter, bottles, cans, rubbish, or refuge of any kind. Not that I want junk on people's property, but I wondered about inserting after any kind, which is visible from adjoining property or a public way, um, might be considered just because, you know, if, if, if you can make the case that it's either a, 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 a nuisance because I have to see it from my property or we have to see it from the street. If it's way in the back of somebody's yard, you know, is it really anybody's business if, if they see it way back in your yard and they want to make an issue? I just, <coughs> that was a consideration. Um, and, and again, at the bottom of that G where it talks about uh, blah, 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 machinery, blah, 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 of any kind, whether or not same could be put to any reasonable use. Um, there are people in town, I can think of several, who do small engine repair and they have various things out in their yard and uh, it is rather unsightly. It's not junk in the sense that it's part of their, whether it's a hobby or, or a small business. Um, so I, 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 you know, to say whether or not the same could be put to any reasonable use, well, if somebody is using it and has use for it, I think that's that's different than stuff that's just uh, I mean some people do run businesses and they, and they have this in, in their yard um, and the bit about vacant buildings you know how no, so so here's the slippery slope you can run run into yep. I mean tonight we all saw the uh, donation to the DPW facility beautifully <laughs> restored tractor beautifully restored tractor yeah uh, from the McIntyres. Um, I kind of doubt that that tractor runs. Could. Can, can it be Can it be put to reasonable use? It could run. That runs? Yeah. So okay. steam, you have to create steam. But if it couldn't, we could say well, that, yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, I mean, if they restored it without it being mechanically operable, mm -hmm. you know, is, is that something that could fall into this? And all of a sudden, you know, it's breaking the bylaw. So I think the hard part on this whole item is the subjectivity. Yeah. So how do you quantify what is and what is not junk right. um, based on the subjectivity? And, and I don't. I think it's it would be impossible to put black and white into like this. Like this is considered junk. This isn't considered junk. Um, if a black tarp stretched across somebody's yard. To cover a bunch of junk is considered in that bylaw. What's to say that person doesn't change that black tarp into a bright hunter's orange picket fence? You know, there, there's there's just there's so much subjectivity to it. It's just hard to quantify it. I, I agree with everybody that it's it's just hard to come up with. No, my wife can quantify and qualify my stuff easily. <laughs> well, I also want to add 143.4 vacant buildings. Um, you know, what about outbuildings? There are a lot of buildings that might fall under this that were never intended for occupancy, so they're not vacant. If it's an outbuilding like a garage or a barn or a work shed, um, you know, where, where do they fit in? And are they supposed to be brought up to fire codes. Um, so didn't we go out and search across Massachusetts for similar bylaws, proposed bylaws mm -hmm. that are in place? We did. And this is what came back from across Massachusetts. So, you know, Massachusetts is not, we're not the only town that's got it figured out or doesn't have it figured out. A lot of other communities use these things all the time. Places we all go to in the summer and places like that, all over the place. Um, I don't know why we reinvent every, every sentence here tonight. These things are in place in Massachusetts everywhere. Why don't we have them in Hopkinton? Well, I think that we should um, 
we should table this for now and have the uh, inspectors come in. And then let's just ask them, because they're the ones who are going to have to enforce it. They know what what's going on in this town. We drive by, we see stuff, we don't like stuff, we like stuff. They're the ones that are going to have to deal with it. They're the, they're, they're the, the subjective uh, voice that's going to uh, uh, enforce this and say well, who's, who's right and who's wrong. So we should bring them in, and then let's, uh, let's continue to talk about it afterwards. At least this year we're getting enough time to talk about it. Last year this did come up. It came came from um, the planning board. They wanted it to be a general bylaw as opposed to a zoning bylaw, so it came to the board of selectmen. At least this time we, we've got a few meetings to talk about it. And to Mr. Sestari's um, uh, inquiry, we should probably have uh, the uh, inspectors here. <laughs> Quite frankly, I walked up on the center trail the other day, and there's an, a place, and they got like old bathtubs and old sinks, and it's art, I guess. I, I would think it looks like old bathtubs and old sinks, but you know, it's a matter of the eye of the beholder, I guess. I mean, I could under this, I could probably complain about that, and they could say, well, that's an expression of art, and I guess it is, and that's okay. <laughs> but you know, that, that's kind of where it puts us here. And and again, the vacant buildings, you know, a lot of the ones that we might be considered falling under this. I've never been intended for occupancy, so something that says, you know, has it been vacant for six months or 180 days or whatever, was well, always been vacant. It's it's a work shed, it's a garage, and you know, being vacant isn't isn't a crime because it's not intended for habitation. It's my tool shed, so there just seems to be a um, okay. a hole there. All right, let's move on from this one, Mr. Kamala. What, is, is there anything else on, for the articles? On this? Um, it, it, perhaps for either Thursday or the next Board of Selectmen meeting, um, I would like to invite John Westerling to come and talk specifically about the articles funded or proposed to be funded through the enterprise funds. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, board liaison reports and board invites. Who do we have for invites? Stop inviting us places. Yeah. Yeah, we have the MAPC Winter Council meeting. Uh, this will be on the 28th of February, 9 a.m. to 11.30. And then there's the Senator Marquis Metro West Town Hall meeting uh, on the 18th of February. Excellent. Good, at least people are still inviting us. Even after the, the bean supper we went to, that was, right. that was a heck of a lot of fun, huh? That was good. It's always Friends good. of Hopkinton. Um, okay, uh, liaison reports. Mr. Sorry, anything? Um, nothing, but uh, there may be something soon. Uh, the Affordable Housing uh, Trust Committee is throwing emails around about getting the meeting together, getting wow. the band back together. Okay, yeah. off. <laughs> and that's at the, so that's at the urgence of our latest appointee, uh, yeah. uh, the urgence of our latest Bye. appointee, Parvati. Uh, so she's having an impact already, and she hasn't even been to a meeting. So there was, after her discussion, there was no way that board was going to sit dormant for one more minute <laughs> after she got up. That's, that's great. great. It's great. It is great. So, uh, so yeah, so we're trying, to, we're trying to get a meeting together. So. Thank you. Ms. Wright? Nothing tonight. Mr. Hurt. I don't think anything tonight. Thank you. So I do. Uh, I had an elementary school building committee meeting last night. Uh, I will report to the board that we are 87% complete. Uh, they're expecting completion <coughs> at the end of May 2018. Uh, they're well under budget. And we are tentatively scheduling a date for the ribbon cutting, which is Saturday, June 9th. Uh, heavy on the tentative. Um, all are encouraged to come. It should be a great uh, a great event and see where some of your tax dollars have gone. Um, they've worked very hard and, and, uh, and they're doing a very good job, those builders and more specifically those committee members. 
No, it's actually, I'm not a liaison to them, but a group I work very closely to, the, the Friends of Hopkinton, we just talked about it, had a, um, the uh, ham and bean supper last uh, Saturday night. And um, it was extremely well attended, a heck of a lot of fun. Everybody had a great time. And it, it was karaoke. It was karaoke. Four generations of clicks up there, belting it out. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's something that uh, that started off, they didn't think they were going to make a lot of money with it a few years ago, but it's really become a hit, and it really is fun. If anybody, watch out for it for next year, because it's a, it's a place to be in Hopkins on, on that Saturday night. I hope they broadcast a little better. I didn't know about it. Oh, okay, well, that's uh, Friends of Hopkins. Get, get send an advertising send an invitation. More exciting than the ones we've been getting. Actually, they, I think they, they did send something out. Yeah, we got something. I don't know. Actually, I got a, I, I got phone calls from oh, a, yeah, from, a, from a former yeah. uh, I'll always take policeman. a town of Hopkins in an event than a marquee. Yes. Silly okay, thing. with that, Mr. Tetsaw. Okay, so um, <laughs> Mr. Kamalo, uh, town manager's report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. In in light of the uh, board's discussion of the proposed FY19 budget, I thought it would be appropriate for me to report back to the board on the implementation of the means tested senior property tax exemption. Uh, this is one of the uh, tools that the town approved at the last annual town meeting uh, specifically to assist seniors uh, for which property taxes were a high financial burden. Um, we have um, working, in fact working with the, the Senator Spilker's office and Representative Dykma's office are in the process of having the legislature approve this home rule petition uh, as an act. Um, the chair, um, Mr. Cotino, and I met with uh, Representative Dykma uh, late last week, uh, on Friday in fact, uh, and she did give us an update on the, the progress so far. Uh, again, this is one of the many tools that um, if, if approved through the legislature, uh, would be one of the tools that the seniors in town who are facing high financial burden through taxation would rely on. Uh, it was supported unanim um, by the majority of town meeting voters uh, in 2017, and we are hoping that uh, this will become law as soon as possible. So do we have any sense of a time frame as to when this could come about? Because you know, we're really looking at the tax year that it's going to matter. I mean, we approved it back May, and it hasn't happened yet. Any any sense from the senator's office? Yeah, <coughs> we yeah we did ask uh, Representative Dykma that question, and I uh, stressed to you that it we it's important to Hopkinton that this be in place in time for our annual town meeting. Um, she didn't commit, but she I think understands our our timeline. Right. Mm -hmm. I stressed it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Yep. Does this have anything? I, I don't know quite where this fits. It's not really a agenda item, and yet I thought of mentioning it with the liaison reports, um, both in terms of being a liaison and just other contacts. I have found if you need to get in touch with somebody on a committee, how hard it is to get contact information for them. Um, I would like to see it required, maybe in the next cycle when we have the new boards and committees in place and after the election, whether we work with Josh or whatever, that it be a requirement on the website under each committee that members have contact information, e an email. Um, you know, we all get contacts from people, and, and I think that's part of the responsibility when you agree to serve. <coughs> if citizens have a question or a comment or they need to get some help, they should be able to get in touch with someone. And, and I've had a difficult time just trying to track down even just an email on people on some of the boards and committees, and, and I would like to see that required. I think yeah. as long as we give them an option to have a town email so that Absolutely. it's not going to their but, personal but if you're going to be on a board, so at least the chairman, 
when you should there should be a means when you look up each of those boards yeah, no, agree. that there be agree. at least one contact for someone to get a conversation started if you have a piece of information you need from one of our town boards. Mm -hmm. If I may, Mr. Chair, in, mm -hmm. in fact, we already have provided and made available town emails for all the chairs of town boards and committees. We're now in the phase of convincing the board members to accept the town email. So we are in the process of addressing that. Not just issue. accept, but check. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I believe that each year, in that case, we should ask the chairman of a committee for an email contact that they are willing to put up on the town website so people can get in touch with them for business with that board. If they use the town email, then they have to agree they're going to check it. But it's just not right that the entire committee be up there with no contact information yeah. at all. Yeah. I think there's a legal obligation that they use a town email address. Because if they're using a private one or they're yeah. using a corporate one, mm -hmm. I yeah. think there's a public records. I think there's a public re records issue there. Yeah. I just think there should be a legal obligation themselves that they be really accessible. Yeah. Them or their yeah. company if they're using their company email. Yeah. So. Whatever we can yeah. do. It's not. It's not fair to people. Yeah, Mr. Hurd, do you have anything? Future agenda? No, thank you. <coughs> Just Mr. one quick thing to build on what uh, Mrs. Wright said a little earlier. This may or may not pertain to two or three people in the room. Um, Monday, April second, two thousand eighteen, is the last day to get your papers in for uh, running for office. Whether you may run or re run for re-election. <coughs> um, Monday, April second, will be the time to get that in. So. Might want to do that a little bit before that. Excellent. And uh, I just want to bring up one thing that uh, the group SafeWise recently released its 2018 Safest Cities in Massachusetts report. And uh, Hopkinton ranked in the top 20 in the state. And as a matter of fact, we are number three in the state of the uh, safest uh, community. So, uh, you know, heartfelt uh, thanks goes out to uh, the chiefs. Thank you, Chief Lee. And, Chief Slammon, I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, it's it's great to see. We're four last year. We're moving up to number three. Still a bronze medal. Still got two to go. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're good job us. to Chief Lee and Chief Slammon. Absolutely. Excellent. Speaking of bronze medals. <laughs> no, we've <it's> got <laughs> with that the chair. I take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>